Sunday in April. Does that sound right? I was going to say happy April, but then I thought, well, we've been at April for a little while. Well, let me uh, pray and we'll get started. Father, we're grateful for today. Grateful for the Holy Spirit and the illumination that he seeks to bring to us. Grateful for the scriptures that you preserve for us. Uh, Grateful for your people. And I just pray that the Spirit will be at work today in Sunday school and in the main service that follows that we might leave here with a greater clarity concerning who you are and who we are relative to you. And help us, uh, equip us, we ask, to live for you this week. (laughs) We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said. Amen. Amen. Well, you might want to locate the book of Revelation, chapter 6, and verse 16. Uh, There's a couple people here that are new, so I just want to apologize in advance to you, because we are in part 45 of a rapture study. So, but hopefully each lesson is self, what what do they call it today? Self-contained. So even if you're just coming to us the first time and you don't, haven't had access to the first 44, hopefully you'll have, uh, you'll get a lot out of lesson 45. And how many churches can say that, by the way? Not very many. Probably none except us, Right. But we're um, in a series where we're trying to defend the pre-tribulational rapture. Um, As we've said before, I don't have a single problem that the rapture wouldn't fix. Can I get an amen on that? (laughs) So what we've done thus far is really a defense of pre-tribulationalism. Or the belief that the rapture will occur before the tribulation starts. That view, for whatever reason, is really under assault today. And there's a big debate in Christianity, probably over the last hundred years or more, concerning the timing of the rapture. Most everybody out there believes in a rapture of some kind, but what they disagree on is the when question. It's not so much the what question, the when question. So we are in the process of critiquing the other views underneath pre-tribulationalism, mid and post and pre-wrath and partial, which contradict everything we've taught thus far. So they teach a different view on the timing of the rapture and we're trying to sort of analyze them and explain them and show their problems and explain why we are still pre-tribulational despite all of the competition. So the one that we've been looking at the last three weeks is called pre-wrath rapturism. It's uh, second from the bottom there. I'm sorry, it's at the bottom, very bottom. And basically what they're trying to argue is that we are going to be here for the first half of the tribulation period and roughly for the first half of the second half of the tribulation. And so we have offered, number one, a description of their view, which you can find here on this chart by Marvin Rosenthal, one of their proponents. And he basically, in this particular book that I got this chart from, The Pre-Wrath Rapture of the Church, he basically teaches that the first half of the tribulation period is not God's wrath. It's the beginning of sorrows. And then the first part of the second half of the tribulation period is not God's wrath. It's a period that he calls the Great Tribulation. And the actual wrath of God does not start until what he calls the day of the Lord, which is roughly the final 25% of the tribulation. And so since the church, he reasons, is promised an exemption from divine wrath, we actually will be here for the first half of the tribulation period and for the first half of the second half of the tribulation period. 
And we don't have the hope of being raptured until that point in time, which he has there on his chart with the arrow. So his arrow is very different than ours. Our arrow is on the far left. We think we're going to be removed before this even starts. But he doesn't believe that. So what we were going through are basically six problems with his view. And these reasons chronologically harmonize with the reasons that we are pre-tribulational that I gave you very early on in this study. Um, I gave you seven reasons. Here we're mentioning just six because the seventh one really isn't pertinent, but these are six reasons why the pre-wrath theory has problems. And the reason it has problems is it disagrees with our six reasons, really seven, that we gave for the pre-tribulational view. So the first problem with their view, and this is all review, by the way, is it places the church into the 70th week of Daniel. And the 70th week of Daniel, as we have studied, concerns Israel and not the church. The second problem with their view is it fails to acknowledge the concept of the missing church. And they basically argue that we're, we're here for Revelation 6. The problem is when you, look at the, you, when you look at that chapter, you never see the word church. And you never see the body of Christ. You never see the bride of Christ. And we say the church isn't there. And they say, yes, it is there. And we say the church isn't there. And they say, yes, it is there. And they haven't been able to produce any evidence that the church is there. It doesn't say church anywhere. Uh, nor does it mention any of the Pauline concepts of the church. So that's review. And where their view is really vulnerable is they confine the wrath of God to only a portion of the second half of the tribulation. So we believe the correct view is the whole thing is God's wrath. <clears throat> Jesus is in heaven, Revelation 5, <clears throat> leading to Revelation 6, opening a seven-sealed scroll, which brings all of these judgments to the earth. The seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the bowl judgments, Jesus is unleashing all of them. And so they all constitute God's wrath as far as we are concerned. Pre-wrath rapturism, as it's taught, doesn't accept that. They, they believe that the wrath of God doesn't start until the final quarter, roughly. And so all of these uh, seal judgments really are not the wrath of God. And in fact, the wrath of God doesn't even show up until you get to Revelation 6, verses 16 and 17, according to their view. And they largely argue that because this is the first time the word wrath is used. So this is the sixth seal judgment, and this is a reference to the unbelievers trying to make sense of what's happening to them. And they make this statement. It says in Revelation 6, verses 16 and 17, they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us, and hide us from the sight of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath, that's the Greek word orge, of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath, there it's repeated, has come and who is able to stand. And so their perspective is basically this idea that this is the first time the wrath of God shows up in the book. And even here, it hasn't completely arrived it's not going to arrive until really the trumpet judgments. And here's what they're arguing. They're arguing that here the wrath of God is sort of imminent. It's uh, what they say portending or portrending. And it's foreshadowing something that is going to happen in the future, in essence. And the last couple of weeks I've been with you, I've tried to show you that that is not what the Greek text says. It's not a statement looking forward, it's a statement looking backward. So one of the things I haven't pointed out yet is it says there in verse 17, for the great day of their wrath has come. 
So instead of focusing on the word wrath, just for a minute, I would like for you to focus on the word come, which is the Greek word erkomai. And if you look at that word come, you'll see that whatever is happening in this sixth seal judgment is something that is connected to the prior seal judgments because of the word come. So whatever you're doing with seal judgment number six, by consistency, you have to also see in the prior seal judgments. Uh, the Holy Spirit, I believe, has been very clear in making this point. And I want to show you this because pre-wrathers basically are saying, well, the word wrath doesn't show up in the prior judgments. The word wrath shows up here. So this is the first time the wrath is poor trending or portending. And I want to show you just very fast that they're focusing on the wrong word. If you, if you leave the subject or the word wrath aside for a moment, and I explained wrath last time to you, why the wrath of God is in those prior seal judgments, leave that aside for a minute and just focus on the word come, you'll see how all of these seal judgments are interrelated. So whatever you're doing with number six, you have to by definition and by extension do with numbers one through five. All of these are the wrath of God. And you see that because of the word come. So notice, uh, if you will, Revelation chapter six, verse one. <clears throat> this is the very beginning of the seal judgments. John writes, then I saw when the lamb had broken one of the seven seals and I heard one of the four living creatures saying as with a loud voice of thunder, what's the next word? Come, that's erkomai. That's the same word that's used here in Revelation 6 verse 17. Uh, drop down, if you could, to Revelation chapter 6, verse 3. This is the third seal judgment. I'm sorry, the second seal judgment. Notice what it says, Revelation 6, verse 3. Then he broke the second seal, and I heard the second living creature say, what? Come. Now, Something real quick that I'll throw in here is that pre-wrathers will basically argue that Jesus is not causing these things. Rather, it's the living creatures that are causing these things. As if Jesus could not use a living creature to accomplish his will. Just because Jesus is using a secondary object, like an angel, for example, to bring forth his wrath doesn't mean that Jesus is somehow not causing the wrath. For example, everybody believes that the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah was the wrath of God. And what you'll discover is God, when he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, did not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah directly. He used a destroying angel to come do it. Remember what the angel said to Lot? Uh, the, the angel came to Lot in Genesis 19, verse 22, and said, I cannot do anything until you're removed from here. So what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah was the wrath of God, and it wasn't God directly pouring out his wrath on Sodom and Gomorrah. He used one of his angels. And that's the same kind of thing that's happening here. Just because the wrath of God is not being immediately executed by Jesus Christ himself, doesn't mean that it isn't the wrath of God because he can use secondary agents like angels to execute his wrath. But notice, if you will, Revelation 6, verse 3, when he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. That's, again, the same Greek word, erkomai. Notice verse 5. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come. My goodness, I'm seeing a pattern here. Look at Revelation, and it's all the same Greek word, erkomai. Notice Revelation 6, verse 7. When the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say what? Say, come. 
And then you finally get to Revelation chapter 6, verse 17, and it says, For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So the word come, or the word erkomai, connects all of the seal judgments together. Does that make sense? So you can't say suddenly the wrath of God is imminent for the first time in Revelation 6, verses 16 and 17, but it's not a subject early on in the, in the chapter. The word come or erkomai connects all of these seal judgments together. So whatever you're doing with seal judgment number six automatically applies to the others. And this is something I find interesting because the pre-wrath people, they don't want you to focus on the word come. They want you to completely focus on the word wrath. But when you focus on the word come, you'll, what you'll see is these seal judgments are interconnected or interrelated with each other. So this whole thing is God's wrath, all of it. And that's why we believe that the entire seven-year period is God's wrath. And so since the church is promised an exemption from divine wrath, if we are the rapture generation, you will not be un in, under any of these seal judgments. Does that make anybody here happy? Makes me happy. Because a lot of people think we put our pre-trib together, pre view together because we're just wishful thinkers. But hopefully what I've tried to demonstrate in this series, and we're on Lesson 45 trying to argue this, that the pre-tribulational view comes from the Bible. I mean, I'm a pre-tribber, not because I'm a wishful thinker. I am sort of a wishful thinker in a way. But I'm a pre-tribber because it's biblical. The Bible promises you an exemption from divine wrath. Jesus is in heaven opening the seven-sealed scroll, causing all of these things. It doesn't matter if he uses a living creature or an angel or anything else to bring these judgments. So a major problem with this pre-wrath uh, pre rapture view as taught by Marvin Rosenthal and others is it confines God's wrath to only a portion of of the tribulation second half. And as my professor, Dr. Toussaint, used to say, that dog won't hunt. All right, continuing on with this list here, the fourth major problem with pre-wrath rapturism, and this is a problem with all the other views, mid-trib, post-trib, is they deny what is called eminency. If you talk to pre-wrath rapturists, I talked to one recently back in December, and I asked him, could Jesus Christ come back today? He said, absolutely not. And by the way, if I should ever drop dead of a heart attack or get hit by a car or something, and you're looking for a new pastor, and you want to know does this new pastor believe in the pre-trib rapture? There's a simple question you could ask him. And I hope you'll hire a him, by the way. Him to determine if he is pre-trib. And you just ask, can Jesus Christ come back today? And if they start to hem and haw and say, well, Jesus can come back soon, just say, that's not what I asked you. I asked you, could he come back in the next split second? And how he answers that question will tell you whether he's pre-tribulational or not. Because we are the only view that teaches that Jesus Christ can come back in the next split second. All the other views have some kind of prophetic scenario that has to take place first. And this gets into the whole subject of eminency. What is eminency? If you're fuzzy on eminency... I would encourage you to go back and review lesson number three, where we spoke of the eminency of the rapture. But eminency basically is the idea that the rapture is signless. There are no prophetic signs that have to transpire first before the rapture can occur. Well, wait a minute, what about the mark of the beast? And what about Bill Gates? And what about the World Economic Forum? And what about vaccinate mandatory vaccinations and what about all this stuff well those are all signs for the tribulation 
Those are signs that are preparing the world for the tribulation period, but there are no signs for the rapture. The rapture will precede all of those things. So if the world stage is being set up this aggressively for the seven-year tribulation period, I'm of the perspective that it is, then all of these signs related to mark of the beast, technology, microchips, all these things that people like to talk about, those have nothing to do with the rapture. Those are signs for the seven-year tribulation period. The rapture is signless. And it's sort of interesting if the world is being set up this aggressively for the seven-year tribulation period and the rapture of the church comes first, then we must be pretty close to the rapture is the way I think on this. So this gets into a doctrine called eminency. When we were talking about eminency in lesson number three, and of course you guys have perfect recollection of that lesson, right? I didn't remember the lesson. I had to go find where it was. We talked about it. But we gave you this quote from Wayne Brindle, who wrote this in Dallas Seminary's academic journal, Bibliotheca Sacra. And he gives four criteria for determining if any given passage in the New Testament is a passage related to the eminency, the any moment appearance of Jesus, the signless event that Jesus is not just coming back soon, but Jesus is coming back next. We don't just believe that Jesus is coming back soon. That doesn't cut it. We believe he's coming back next. It is the next event on the prophetic calendar, which is completely and totally signless. So when you're reading the New Testament, how can you determine if any given passage is related to that doctrine or not? Wayne Brindle, formerly of Liberty University, says in this article, four criteria may be suggested, any one of which indicates eminency. Number one, the passage speaks of Christ's return at any moment. Number two, the passage speaks of Christ's return as near without stating any signs that must precede his coming. Number three, the passage speaks of Christ's return as something that gives believers hope and encouragement without indicating that these believers will suffer tribulation. Number four, the passage speaks of Christ's return as giving hope without relating it to God's judgment of unbelievers. So when you're going through the New Testament and you run into a passage that meets one or more of these criteria, you're dealing with an eminency passage. And you're dealing with, therefore, a rapture, eminency, signless event, passage, reminding us that Jesus Christ can come back in the next split second. That's what's meant by eminency. So let me give you a few of such passages um, that clearly, in my mind, speak of eminency. Notice John 14, verse 3. This is the first time the doctrine of the rapture is revealed by Jesus in the upper room. And you know this passage well. It says, do not let your heart be troubled, believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house are many dwelling places, if it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself after you've suffered under the wrath of the Antichrist for three and a half years. Whoops, doesn't say that, does it? It says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am you may be also, and you know the way where I am going. So you notice here that Jesus, when he's describing the rapture, never puts any prophetic sign before it. He never says, don't take the vaccine, watch out for Bill Gates, be careful about microchip technology. And I think we should be aware of those things. But those are signs for the tribulation, not the rapture. There is no prophetic sign that has to transpire according to Christ's own words 
before the rapture can take place. Pre-wrath rapturism denies that. They insert three quarters of the tribulation period in between us and the coming of Jesus to receive us to himself, even though the passage says no such thing. Uh, that's a passage that we would call a passage related to eminency. Um, I don't have this on the screen, but slip over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. Just find the T's. It's kind of confusing to flip around in the Bible because the Bible isn't organized. The Protestant New Testament is not organized in the order in which the letters were given. So there's an easy way to remember this. It's just uh, go eat popcorn. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And if you don't like popcorn and you're on a diet, you can use God's, because maybe thinking of popcorn will tempt you to break your diet. Personally, I think it's okay to eat popcorn, just don't put too much butter on it. But, so you don't like popcorn, okay, use God's electric power company. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And so you open your New Testament and that kind of gives you an order and you can turn to books fast just knowing that little thing. And then just remember that the T's are kind of in the back before you get to the book of Hebrews and James. So you'll get your Timothy, Titus, your Thessalonian books, etc. And you'll be flipping to Bible verses just like that and everybody will think you're just very, very spiritual. So notice 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. This is a rapture passage. And it says, Paul says, to wait for the Antichrist first. No, it doesn't say that, does it? To wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. Now, if you're a pre-wrath rapturist, the passage has to say to wait for, number one, the peace treaty with the Antichrist, and then three and a half years, and then the desecration of the temple, and then the first half of the second half of the tribulation period, who rescues us from the wrath to come. So you'll notice that pre-wrath rapturists cram a bunch of stuff into the passage that isn't there. The Bible never tells us to be looking for all of those other things I was spoke, speaking about. It tells us to look for Jesus because he is the, his coming for us is the next signless event on the prophetic horizon. In fact, that event is so eminent and it could happen so fast, it could happen before this Bible study is even over. And some of you may be praying for that to happen. I'm praying for it to happen. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10, to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus whom he rescues us from the wrath to come. Clearly that fits some, if not all, of Wayne Brindle's criteria. So that is a rapture passage. Notice, same book, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 15. As you know, 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18 is probably the fullest description we have of the rapture anywhere in the New Testament. And it says this, verse 15, after describing the rapture, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we, who is Paul including in that promise? Himself. In other words, Paul thought that this could happen in his lifetime. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Paul believed so aggressively in the doctrine of eminency that he believed that it could happen in the next split second in his lifetime and he would be taken. Now Paul died, and so essentially Paul is going to be part of that group coming down because the dead in Christ will rise first. 
So Paul is going to participate in the rapture. It just it didn't happen in his lifetime. But the way Paul sets this up is it can happen in the next split second. And Paul says, I myself, with all the believers on the earth, could be taken in the harpazo. He doesn't say anything here about an antichrist coming first. He says the same thing in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, which um, is also a passage about the rapture. He says, behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed. And we like to joke that that's the verse you put on your nursery at your church, right? We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. I tell you a mystery, we will not all sleep. In other words, not all die. There's a generation that's not going to die. But we will be changed. So you'll notice once again here, Paul puts himself as, as this could happen in the next split second. I could go. I could not die. I could be transformed in an instant into my resurrected body, which is what happens for the believer at the church age believer at the point of the rapture. So you'll notice again the word we. No hint here of an antichrist coming first. He doesn't say, now when Israel is regathered, you know, now get ready. Watch out for the temple being desecrated. All of that has to be thrust into the passage to make mid-trib work, post-trib work, pre-wrath rapturism to work. But the New Testament simply doesn't teach that. It teaches that the next event on the prophetic horizon is the personal return of Jesus in the rapture. Uh, notice 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. Now, the go eat popcorn is not going to help you here. So what you have to remember is when you get to the New Testament, there's these things called the Gospels which are records of the life of Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Then you get to Acts, a big book. Then you get to the big books Paul wrote, which are what? Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. Then you get beyond 2 Corinthians, and that's where you can go eat your popcorn and get to the T's. See, and I'm telling you all this stuff because I wish someone had explained this to me when I was a new Christian. I was like, you know, the pastor would say, turn to such and such, and I would be the guy still leafing through everything trying to find it. And I didn't appear as spiritual to my peers as I wanted. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7 says, so that, so that you are lack, not lacking in any gift. He's saying that to the Corinthians. You're not lacking in anything. And what does he say here in verse 7? Awaiting eagerly the revelation of, what's the next words? Our Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't say awaiting eagerly the revelation of the Antichrist. He's saying you're awaiting the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what we're waiting for. That's where our focus is. And when the focus becomes so into, oh no, the decline of America, oh no, the new world order, all, all of which are very valid and important subjects, your focus changes. The focus of the New Testament for the church age believer is to be looking for Jesus at any moment. Notice the book of Philippians chapter 3 verse 20. So there's your popcorn. Go eat popcorn. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Paul the Apostle says, For our citizenship is in heaven, in which we also eagerly await, what? For a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not the foggiest hint here of wait for the temple's desecration peace treaty between Israel and the Antichrist. He, does, he never hints at the fact that the Antichrist is coming first, which is what all these other views are saying. Why, why is Paul not dealing with those subjects? Because he's not dealing with end times prophecy here in the sense of the seven-year tribulation. What he's dealing with is where our focus should be, which is Jesus, and he's dealing with eminency, which demonstrates that Christ can turn 
or return in the next split second. And then getting into the T's, notice Titus 2 verse 13. It's a description here of what we as Christians are looking for in the age of the church. Looking for what? The blessed hope. See, these other rapture positions, that's not what they're looking for. That's why there's so much focus on the deterioration of our world. Because they believe that these signs precede the imminent return of Jesus. And I'm trying to explain that that's not the focus of the epistles or the Greek New Testament. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of Antichrist. No. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Uh, And then you kind of keep moving right and you run into Hebrews and after that, James which we're studying on Wednesdays, by the way. So we invite you to participate either in-house or online. But notice James chapter 5, verse 8, a tremendous statement here on eminency. You too, be patient, strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is what? It's near. Now, in Greek, it's at hand. Um. The best illustration I can think of it is, I don't know, remember those plastic uh, balls that we can play with as kids and it had Velcro around it and you could throw it up at the ceiling and it would stick on the ceiling? Oh, come on, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? And it's stuck up on the ceiling and it could, it, could, it could come off the ceiling at any minute, right? But you don't know exactly when. That's the rapture. Whatever works, right? (laughs) So Jesus is that Velcro ball. He went up, ascension. He's been engaged in his um, high priestly ministry at the Father's right hand for 2,000 years. And any minute, wow, he could come back. So that's the doctrine of, of eminency. So we are looking for Jesus Christ. We are not looking for the Antichrist. Now, should we teach on the doctrine of the Antichrist? Sure, it's in the Bible. Should we teach on the doctrine of the tribulation period? Of course, it's all in the Bible. But that's not, those are never to be the focus of the church age Christian. We're looking for Jesus Christ. Now, look at this book here. Look at the title of it. This guy's not a pre wrath rapturist, he's a post tribber. Look at the title of his book. It's called First the Antichrist. And you look at something like this and you wonder how somebody so smart could have missed something so basic. The Bible never says first the Antichrist. There's not a single passage that says first the Antichrist. We're assured the Antichrist is coming, but what it actually says is Jesus. Jesus Christ could come back at any moment. And Of all of the doctrines in the Bible that Satan is trying to destroy, this would be one of them. Because if you believe this, as I'm trying to explain it, it completely changes the way you make choices in life. If this could be the day when Jesus comes back and the Holy Spirit has set this up for the Christian to think that any day could be the day. And if you really believe that, then it changes almost everything in your life. It changes the conversations that you have. It changes how you look at evangelism. When the Spirit of God prompts you to share your faith with somebody, you look at the person differently because, gosh, if I don't share my faith with them, the rapture could happen and they could be left behind to face the horrors of the tribulation period. Not that there's not a possibility that they could get saved in the tribulation period, but why not take the path of least resistance? It changes decisions that we make, and this is why daily life, you'll notice in these passages I just read, I just read James 5, 8, you too be patient, 
strengthen your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. You'll notice how strength and patience are linked to eminency. In other words, if you don't have the doctrine of eminency straight, suddenly what starts to disappear from your life, according to God's own written word, is patience and endurance. So this is why Satan hates the doctrine of eminency, because it's linked over and over again to daily life. And if you really believe in the doctrine of eminency, it changes life's choices. And if that doctrine is severed from Christianity, which all of these other rapture views in essence are doing, and you deny the idea that Christ can come back at any moment, then all of the links to daily life, holiness, patience, perseverance, all of those are kind of marginalized. So my professor, J. Dwight Pentecost, said this in class, and I found it also in one of his books, He says, a short time ago, I took occasion to go through the New Testament and to mark each reference to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and to observe the use made of that teaching about his coming. I was struck anew with the fact that almost without exception, when the coming of Christ is mentioned in the New Testament, it is followed by an exhortation to godliness and holy living. So, being the arrogant seminary student that I was, when he made that statement, I really didn't believe it was true. So I started to do my own search. And I have found what he says here to be true, and in spades it's true. And and don't believe me, do your own search. And look at all of the references to the return of Christ, particularly eminency passages, and you'll see over and over again that they're always linked to something in your life, your prayer life, your giving, your service. It's all linked to this idea that Jesus can come back at any moment. Because if you believe that Jesus can come back at any moment, it's sort of like your boss that says I'm going to step out of the office but I'm going to be poking my head in at any moment. Your work habit has a tendency to stay consistent if that's true. If your boss says I'm going to be gone for two months, see you in two months, uh, you know and I know how that story is going to end. There's a tendency to become lethargic, lackadaisical because you can always correct the ship a week down the road or two weeks down the road or half a month down the road or three quarters of a month, etc. This is why the Holy Spirit wants us to understand this doctrine of eminency. And this is why there is an attack that's, the, the level of it, when you follow this, it's, it's, it's mind-numbing in terms of the ferocity of hatred out there, people in the name of Christ, have towards this doctrine. And it's, it's, a level, it's a decibel level that's inexplicable unless you understand that it's part of the angelic conflict because Satan wants the church weak and impotent and ineffective. And there's no greater way to render the church that way than to clip from the mind of the Christian the doctrine of eminency. Notice 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3. Now we're past the Paul's letters, and you just keep kind of moving right, and eventually you'll hit the three John letters. John wrote, as you know, five books of the New Testament, the Gospel of John, the Book of Revelation, and 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. And he wrote those in his 90s. So there's a lot of Christians that say, well, I'm old and I've done my part. I'm going to check out. No, (laughs) as long as you're alive, God has something for you to do. Uh, Maybe you're not going to write books of the New Testament. You couldn't because the canon of Scripture is shut. But as long as you're alive, God has you on this earth to do something. So this mindset that, well, I'm old and I'm tired and I don't care anymore. That's not a biblical attitude. 
So 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3, John says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, now you'll notice John here describes Antichrist elsewhere in this book. But he doesn't say the Antichrist is coming first. The whole focus here in these verses is the any moment appearance of Jesus. We know that when he, capital H, so it's talking about Jesus Christ, when he appears, we will be like him. Because we will see him as he is. Why does he say that? Because I'll be in a resurrected body without even the potential for sin anymore when he appears. That's part of the rapture package. And then John says, okay, uh, let's close our Bibles now and have a nice day. Doesn't do that because verse 2 is followed by verse 3. And everyone who has this hope, what hope? The one he just started, finished talking about in verse 2. The fact that Jesus can come back in the next split second. The fact that we as Christians are looking for Jesus to come back and rescue us from this earth. Everyone who has this hope set on him. Now there's our problem because a lot of times our minds are not set on him. They're set on countless other things. But when your mind is set on him because you think his coming is next... Everyone who has this hope set on him, what does he do? He purifies himself. Just as he, Jesus, is pure. I mean, would you want Jesus to come back and find you in an unholy state in terms of your choices? You get into a conversation with somebody and you start to gossip about that person. And then you stop yourself and you say, well, wait a minute now. Jesus can come back right in the middle of this conversation. Therefore... I don't, I don't want to be embarrassed when he comes back. So I'll just choose to remove myself from the conversation or I'll get into something more edifying. You know, you're watching something on television. You're with your cell phones and tablets. Something comes up on the screen that really is probably not the most edifying or holy thing to think about. And you say to yourself, well, you know, you know, Jesus can come back and find me watching this movie or looking at this thing. And so what I'm going to do is just not involve myself in this sinful activity because I really don't want to be embarrassed when he comes back. Now, if you're pre-wrath, you'll basically say, well, I've got at least 42 months and more to get this problem under control. And so there's a tendency to become lackadaisical. It's... um. It's kind of like what my parents did to me uh, when I was in high school. They pulled a really dirty trick on me. They told me once, we're leaving Friday and we're coming back Sunday. So you're the steward of our home during that time period. So what do you think happened to their house Friday night, Saturday? I won't fill in any details here but it doesn't take a lot of imagination. And then Sunday rolls around, "Uh uh-oh, mom and dad are coming back. Let's get everything cleaned up, da-da-da-da-da. Well, one time they said, we're leaving Friday and we can come back any time between Friday evening and Sunday. It has a totally different influence on your stewardship of their home. You see that? That's the doctrine of eminency. That's what it does. This is why Satan hates it. And he's raised up all of these, Satan has, all of these forces out there trying to tear the doctrine down. It's, it's, it's spiritual warfare. It's part of the angelic conflict. You remember the parable that Jesus told in Matthew 24, verses 46 through 50? And yes, this does concern Israel, but you can still learn truths from it about the doctrine of eminency and why the doctrine of eminency is so important. Jesus said in Matthew 24, beginning in verse 46, blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. 
But if that evil slave says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time, and begins to beat his fellow servants, and eats and drinks with those habitually drunk, then the master of that slave will come on a day that he does not expect and an hour that he does not know. So what he's describing here is somebody that's lost sight of eminency. Because they're saying to themselves, my master can't come back for a long time. There's some prophetic scenario that has to unfold first before my master can come. And if you start to reason that way, then you become carnal. It's easy to beat your fellow slaves and eat and drink with those who are habitually drunk. And then the Lord comes back at a time you're not expecting and you're embarrassed about your condition. So it's a wonderful verse there about the impetus of the doctrine of eminency. So what is the pre-wrath rapture view saying about eminency? They are denying eminency, just like mid-tribulationalism denies eminency. Just like post-tribulationalism denies eminency. What they're saying is we are not going to be raptured until the middle of the second half, roughly. So that means before Jesus can come back, there's got to be a peace treaty between the Antichrist and unbelieving Israel. There's got to be the whole first half. There's got to be the desecration of the temple. There's got to be half of the second half. In fact, all of these seal judgments has to happen first. And then finally, Jesus can come back and rescue us. What is being denied here? Very simply, all of these passages we've been looking at concerning eminency. Uh, Tony Kessinger, in his critique of pre-wrath rapturism, says... The doctrine of eminency holds that Christ can come to rapture his church at any moment. Believers in the church, including the Apostle Paul, believed that Christ could come in their lifetime. In fact, sometimes in the Bible you'll run into the expression Maranatha. That's what that expression Maranatha means. It means the Lord can come at any moment. Tony Kessinger goes on and he says, the church sees this doctrine as an incentive for ministry and godly living. Does this mean that Christ's return for his church will be at any moment without any sign and with no yet to be fulfilled prophecy, prophesied events to precede it? Pre-wrath rapturists argue that Christ could come in any generation, but there will be signs. That's why Van Campen's book that sort of launched this pre-wrath rapturism, it's called The Sign. Because there's signs that have to happen before Jesus can come back for us in the rapture. Pre-wrath rapturists argue that Christ could come in any generation, but there have to be signs that will herald the general time of his coming. Those include the emergence of the Antichrist, wars and rumors of wars, famine, pestilence, and cosmic disturbances. Pre-wrath rapturists emphasize, Christ's, uh, emphasize Christians' expectancy of Christ's return rather than its eminence. The expectancy of Christ's return is the catalyst for holy living. So the best you're going to get from pre-wrath rapturists is he can come back soon. They never say he can come back next. And I'm of the persuasion that if you lose sight of the idea that he can come back next, all of these uh, emphasis or impetuses for holy living disappear. I want you to understand something, that you're as holy as you could possibly be positionally. But in the walk of sanctification, we allow our practice to catch up with our position. The more our daily practice catches up with our position, the more we're becoming progressively sanctified. 
whether you make great progress in the area of progressive sanctification or not does not determine your salvation. You are already positionally holy if you placed your faith in Christ alone. But God wants to not just give you salvation and heaven. He wants to give you authority and rewards when he comes back. And he's not going to be giving crowns to people that are carnal Christians. He wants to reward people that are faithful. He wants to reward people that are doing the right thing when nobody is looking. And if you steal away eminence, which is what all of these other views, including pre-wrath rapturism, essentially do, then you have just taken away from the church one of the greatest tools that the Holy Spirit has given for progressive sanctification. The any moment return of Jesus Christ. Robert Leitner, my professor, critiques pre-wrath rapturism as follows. The pre-wrath rapture view is different from the normal pre-tribulational view in that it does not consistently distinguish between God's program with Israel and his program with the church. The way it differs is that it has the church in Israel's 70th week, we've covered that, and does not hold to the doctrine of eminency. Gerald Stanton, in his very wonderful book called Kept from the Hour, critiques Marvin Rosenthal's view as follows. Rosenthal's last chapter incorporates a final summary of his various positions and also a final attack against pre-tribulationalism and some of its leaders. The chapter sets forth the pre-wrath rapture view as a catalyst for holy living without recognizing that much of that catalyst is lost if 42 months of sorrows and another 21 months of battle and martyrdom from the beast must come first. So you see, pre-wrathers will say, well, we believe in holy living too. But at the same time, what they give you with their right hand, they're taking away with their left hand the very doctrine that does more than any single doctrine that I can think of as a catalyst for holy living. So the major problem with pre-wrath rapturism, as we're wrapping up here, uh, point D, is that it denies eminency. In fact, if you really get into what they're saying, they're not really preparing people to meet Jesus. They're preparing people to meet the Antichrist. I'm not here preparing people to meet the Antichrist. I'm preparing people to meet Jesus Christ. And if you go through your life one week thinking you're going to meet Jesus Christ, and the next week thinking you're going to meet the Antichrist, you will be an emotional basket case. That's why they're always focused on the news, and I'm, I'm in favor of looking at the news too, but I do it through a pre-trib grid. Always focused on the economy, always focused on interest rates, always focused on the political situation, always focused on inflation, and you go on to their websites and YouTube channels, and that's all they can talk about. There's, there's just not a lot of talk about, hey, Jesus is coming back next. And that's why when you run into pre-wrath rapturists, and I've sadly had my collision courses with a lot of them, they are some of the most disgruntled, unhappy people lacking in joy that you'll ever meet. It's like people that drink engine oil for breakfast. They're so angry at everything. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, if I was an unsaved person and I saw all of this angst, I don't even know why I'd want to become a Christian, quite frankly. 
I was attracted to Christianity as a young person because I saw people walking in the joy of the Lord. Which at that time in my life, I didn't know what that was or how to even get that. But that's what initially drew me. What, how would I have felt as a young person being around people that are so tense all of the time? Um, and so, believe it or not, folks, ideas you know, do have consequences. And of all of the views out here, we're the only view that Jesus, that teaches that Jesus Christ can come back next. The rest of them, including pre-wrath rapturism, do not teach that. And so we'll pick this up uh, next time. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for your word, grateful for your truth. Help us to rightfully divide your truth in these last days so we don't walk in confusion. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Happy intermission.